Well, folks, we're at the final panel and certainly not the least, re Reviving Labor's Constitution. And we're just delighted to have this panel with us today. So we hand it over to KT to introduce them. <laughs> so we should talk about them all. <laughs> okay, well, so I'm going to try to be brief so that we can. Is it not on? Yeah. Oh. Okay, I'll try to be brief so that we can move on through through the comments. Um, but I just have to say, first of all, thank you, Jonathan, for inviting us all to be here. Thank you for having a panel on uh, what is perhaps one of the most central issues around L LPE. And uh, thank you for having coffee and cookies because I don't think I would have made it without that. So, and I think there's there's much um, uh, interest in that. So. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves rather than me giving a list and then uh, going along. So um, I'm KT Alveston. I am a member of the faculty here at Berkeley Law and over in the JSP program. Um, and so my role today is to maybe provide us a, a, a brief framing and then turn it over to my many colleagues to talk about this. So the the brief framing that I want to provide uh, for this panel is the elephant in the room, which is the devolution of the employment relationship. So, so much of our political economy around protecting workers is built around employment, but um, the devolution of the formal employment relationship has essentially undercut uh, the mid 20th century bargain that was the high watermark of uh, economic protection for the middle class. Um, or at least for part of the middle class. Uh, so a significant proportion of the workforce is now in, quote, alternative arrangements or precarious employment. Uh, a paper by a Harvard economist estimated that the percentage of workers engaged in alternative work arrangements uh, defined as temporary health agency workers, on-call workers, contract workers, and independent contractors, or so-called independent contractors, and freelancers, rose from about 10.7% in 2005 to about uh, 15.8% in 2015. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 10% of workers now rely on gig work for their um, primary income. And about half the jobs that have been created between 1995 and 2013 were non-standard jobs in the sense that they were part-time, temporary, or gig work. And about 17% of workers in the United States are in precarious jobs. It will surprise no one that younger female and Hispanic and Black workers are more likely to be in these precarious jobs, although precarity is also growing among white men. So faced with this reality, uh, uh, it has um, some grim implications. One of which of course, is that workers who are not in formal legal employment relationships lose all the legislative hard, hard fought and hard won legislative protections that are conditioned on that relationship, like work compensation, unemployment insurance, uh, what little unpaid family leave we have in this country, social security contributions, protections from discrimination, accommodations for disability, uh, protections for a safe workplace, and the list goes on. Um, in addition, workers in these precarious positions, uh, positions are much less likely empirically to have the benefits that employers provide, uh, often subsidized by tax incentives, such as health insurance, paid sick time, retirement benefits, and paid family and medical leave. Um, so these are well-known problems, but there are also more subtle concerns about precarious employment and the social control of workers. So a growing business model is that employers hire more workers than they need in formal employment, not guarantee a regular schedule or number of hours per week of work. Um, and in some of my own work, I find that uh, empirical evidence that managers utilize the threat of fewer hours on the schedule at to discourage workers from using the rights that they have, even as employees. So those rights can be ephemeral if they mean giving up income. So precarity then becomes a lever of social control that erodes rights from within, even for workers who have formal employment relationships. For workers that don't have those employment uh, relationship status, social control is even more apparent through arbitrary job loss, um, subject to unregulated discretion, uh, as Vina's written about, black box algorithmic management that systematically reduces workers' take to them, um, not having any power to negotiate around employment conditions, uh, uh, vulnerabil vulnerability to authoritarian treatment. Um, and all of this is in part 
uh, because of a lack of any alternative means to support other than precarious work. So uh, US social policy has not kept up with the devolution of the employment relationship, which is why there are so many people in employment relationships that have virtually no protections. Um, and employers are increasingly redefining their relationship with their workers as not employment, but instead independent contracting, even when the nature of the employment or even the way that it's performed has not changed at all. Um, this is what I call the definitional defense to the regulation of employment. We'll just call it something else, and therefore all of these laws will no longer apply. Um, so what do we do? Um, so if the goal is to provide these minimum uh, that uh, have been set out um, by Willie, um, excuse me, and his co-author for uh, um, uh, for what the world should look like: restraints against oligarchy, political political economy that sustains a robust middle class, and constitutional principles of inclusion. How do we accomplish that with this devolution of employment? Um, it's hard to imagine that we can go back to the mid-century bargain is what I wanna to suggest today. Um, in part because uh, collective bargaining reaches only a small proportion of workers. And even if we were to strengthen it, it's hard to imagine that it would reach um, everyone. And even if it were strengthened and expanded, it would still put the burden on workers themselves to wrest a decent living and working conditions from employers one contract at a time. Um, also increasingly workers buy into this idea that independent work is entrepreneurial work and valorized in the American um, even if employers continue to have significant control over their work. So uh, how do we go about this? What should we do? Um, in my view, the narrow focus on trying to restructure the relationship between employment and labor, either through uh, increasing the power of collective bargaining or trying to uh, classify uh, independent contractors back to be uh, uh, what they actually are in most instances with employees um, is going to miss important questions about institutional design and social welfare. So uh, one of the problems that we face is not just the narrow issues around contract, but the larger issues around uh, how what was once market state and civil society has become largely market in a neoliberal world at, with few state uh, guardrails. Um, and so I want to suggest that the role of the state is not just in regulation, it's in providing an alternative safety net that diminishes the powers of employers. Um, and so that means removing expenditures for basic social insurance and, and basic um, protections from uh, the power of employers, largely funded through uh, tax incentives, and back to the state. So I think our strategy should be, and this is a provocative statement to try and see if I can uh, uh, provoke an argument this late in the afternoon, uh, that we take the role of legislation and government seriously. Um, and what we want from the, the role of the state is putting the means of basic stable survival in the hands of workers rather than capital to take away the leverage that capital has in forcing workers to accept employment relationships uh, rather than having the dignity of being able to retire um, uh, with dignity, be able to have access to health care, be able to paid leave or pay sick time um, without having to get permission from their employers. So I'll start there. Do we really want to focus our attention on the employment contract and reify the importance of contract, or do we want to reimagine the in institutions that surround employment? And then I'm going to turn it over to our speakers and see what they have to say. So go ahead, Dina. So um, I, my name is Vina Duval. I'm a professor of law at the University of California uh, in San Francisco School of Law. And I am a psychologist and was trained here um, at Berkeley um, by formally by KT and Jonathan, Jonathan taught law class in this room. Um, so it's a little, a little bit surreal being on this yeah. side of the podium and not way back there. Hi. Um, and, and many, many, um, or taught me through, through their writing. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. And I do want to take seriously the call today to reflect on what I learned from Will's 
beautifully written, compelling, and richly detailed historical account of progressive constitutional political economy, and what I understood to be their central normative message for those of us thinking about law, labor, and class struggle. In drawing on the intellectual and political debates over constitutional political economy during critical epochs in US history, Willie and Joey implore us today in the face of hostile courts to participate in a left or liberal rebuilding of a legal culture of constitutional political economy. And this is cultural language is mine, not theirs, but I use this as an entree to think about this conversation in the context of social and labor, something that Angela Harris pushed us to do this morning. Taking their call in the history that they lay out to heart and applying it to the lived political realities of the self-organizing immigrant and Black low-income workers with whom graphic research, I couldn't help but think about the Ninth Circuit's recent decision in Olson v. State of California. Just a few weeks ago, the Ninth Circuit issued a decision written by Judge Rawlinson, an African-American judge appointed by Bill Clinton, who was the first Black woman admitted to the Nevada State Bar. Judge Rawlinson and her two colleagues found unanimously that AB5, the California state law that codified the Supreme Court's dynamics decision, the California Supreme Court's dynamics decision, and extended a presumption of employment and the use of the ABC test to determine which workers exist outside of state employment protections. Um, they found unanimously that this law violates the equal protection rights of on-demand gig firms. And it's worth noting that the 2018 Dynamics decision made an explicit nod to political stating that the decision was motivated by the purpose of wage laws to, quote, help workers provide at least minimally for themselves and their families and to accord them a modicum of dignity and self-respect, end quote. Now, this might be common sense to us that this is the purpose of employment laws, but we cannot take this common sense for granted. Right-wing social movements are increasingly re rebuilding a neo lochnerian critique of rights and distributive fairness, and they have been wildly successful in pitting civil rights against economic rights. The California Civil Rights Commission is, as we speak, formally examining whether employment rights violate the civil rights of immigrant and racial minority workers by forcing them to be employees and undermining their freedom to work as they choose. The House Workforce Protection Subcommittee, in, in, in not the California House, the, the US House, is next week holding a hearing called Examining Biden's War on Independent Contractors, specifically aimed at undermining the confirmation of Julie Sue to the Department of Labor for her work in California employment laws. And of course, none of the California Supreme Court's language about economic fairness made its way into this Ninth Circuit decision. While we are familiar with the weaponization of the First Amendment to undermine labor rights, Olson took a wildly painful and jarring turn. As we all know, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment solidified the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and made illegal the Black Codes, the system of laws that emerged during Reconstruction to restrict the property rights of former slaves. In its very essence, it was about, as John Powell reminded us this afternoon, belonging and citizenship of racial economic fairness, of racial equality of opportunity. Indeed, today, the Equal Protection Clause remains the most cited constitutional source of civil rights protections, the primary legal vehicle to uphold racial equality, which for reasons Devin Carbato articulated early, earlier, it does poorly. While corporate personhood has more recently been entrenched by cases like Hobby Lobby and Citizens United, often trumping the individual rights people, the equal protection jurisprudence remains clear. If a law does not concern a fundamental right or suspect classification, race, national origin, etc., then the court has to ask, is the law rationally related to a legitimate government interest? Using the standard, the lower court dismissed Uber's equal protection challenge, and many of us who examined Uber's complaint were truly flummoxed by this argument. It seemed, frankly, silly, an effort by overpaid lawyers to throw everything at the wall to see what might stick. The district court agreed. Judge Dolly McGee of the federal district court wrote that the state of California had a clear rational interest in addressing rampant misclassification of gig economy workers. Further, Judge McGee responded to the company's allegation that they were targeted, finding that legislatures always draw lines in legislation creating carve-outs and exemptions, that this is an unavoidable part of crafting laws. 
And yet the Ninth Circuit, not the Fifth Circuit, but the Ninth Circuit overturned this hold, finding that AB5, a law that would extend employment protections to racial minority workforces, violated the rights of Uber. Indeed, Judge Rawlinson wrote, Uber, quote, plausibly alleged that AB5 violates the Equal Protection Clause for those firms engaged in app-based ride-hailing and delivery Uber's primary allegation was that the law was the product of irrational and unconstitutional animus against Uber. The evidence for this alleged animus came primarily from the tweets of the bill's author, former Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez. Now, AB5 was written, again, to address the economic rights of misclassified workforces, including these workers, that research finds are routinely underpaid and denied basic protections. Misclassified workers in these sectors and other include nail salon workers, trucking and construction industries, janitorial industries, et cetera. All of these workers, again, are. AB5 was ultimately undermined by an industry sponsored bill, Prop 22, which carved Uber, Instacart, DoorDash, and Lyft out of the protections afforded by AB5. My own research analogizes Proposition 22 to the racial wage codes proffered by industrialists during the New Deal era, offering Black workers lower wage guarantees than white workers. If anything, it was Proposition 22 that violated the Equal Protection Clause, not AB5. It was Proposition 22 that undermined not just the individual rights of Black and immigrant workers, but also their collective rights the possibilities of democratic self-governance through the construction of labor unions. And while some analysts have viewed Olson as another feather in the hat of Uber's litigation wins, thank you, Ted Boutros, and nothing more, the implications of it must be understood in a much larger context. Gonzalez, who wrote AB5, is a well-regarded and passionate labor leader who brought her commitment to workers legislator. While in office, she helped to write first of their kind laws to address the exacting labor practices of companies like Amazon and McDonald's. During legislative battles against these and other powerful corporations with large market shares and outsized impacts on vulnerable workers, she often said yes on Twitter, named names, Uber, DoorDash, Amazon, Instacart, Lyft, McDonald's, Walmart, and many, many others. Does the recent Olson decision mean that each of these companies can now allege that the state laws passed to better the lives and labor conditions of mostly racial minority workforce violate the civil rights of the corporations for which they labor? In an age of glowing, growing labor monopsony, is legislation broadly aimed at specific corporate bad actors with outsized labor market impacts unconstitutional? What does this mean for the future of constitutional political economy? In an age of vast racialized inequality and glowing um, labor monopsony, monopsony power, does this mean that in a perverse twist, the Equal Protection Clause can now be used to directly undermine the economic rights of Black and other racial minority workers in favor of their employers? More broadly, does it mean that lawmakers simply cannot legislate to regulate the practices of companies that have an outsized influence on labor markets? Because to do so means that the state is, is exhibiting irrational animus toward the corporation and violating its civil rights. While this decision may be overturned by a panel, we cannot take its outcome for granted. So as a legal anthropologist who spends most of my time with self-organizing workers, most of them racial minorities who are organizing, or whose organizing is often aimed at enacting or enabling state protections, not at the firms that employ them, right? Because these are, these are, are in gray areas carved out of employment law. So they're asking the state for protections, not demanding a union directly from their employer. This decision left me and them feeling incredibly hopeless. So thinking about Joey and Willie's pre prescriptive chapter, the last chapter, what do we do? Going back to cultivating new constitutional legal cultures, um, this book forced me to think about how we might talk about this decision as unconstitutional to build a discursive movement, redefining, recapturing what this means. So suing to allege that Proposition 22 violates the Equal Protection Clause is, of course, risky in this particular moment. Yeah. And so I believe that the, the, the cultural work needs to be done and is being done not in the courts, but rather on the streets, that is, in the context of social and labor. Workers have done this primarily by organizing without law, and indeed, sometimes in opposition to it, rejecting the threats of antitrust liability and instead speaking.
their intuition about how the laws are supposed to work to protect their freedom of association to organize for racial and economic equality. And they frame this in dual and opposing terms as an act of civil disobedience, but also as engaging in actions that they have the right to engage in. And I wanna argue that this tension of claiming legal protection while acting in opposition to the law by appealing to a moral political economy is an intrinsically important aspect of what it will take to build a new constitutional political economy. One that mirrors the work of civil rights agitators of the 1960s and of the labor radicals of the early 20th century. So in my article on Prop 22 as the new racial wage code, I reference how workers often evoke the politics of a third category of work law in moral and not just economic terms. And your book has pushed me to ask, what would it mean for them to say this in constitutional terms, unattached to actual legal allegations made in court? And in turn, what might these popular forms of legal culture and understanding do to judicial understandings? And most importantly, how do we create this discourse and from whom does it come? And these are lessons that I think are really important embedded in your story that, um, that I hope as, as, um, as the Hewlett um, gentleman who opened, uh, opened the, the conference today, um, that I hope sort of comes out in a, in a more sort of clear way for organizers to sort of use. So these are the exciting places and thoughts and questions that, that reading your amazing book has pushed me, um, pushed me towards, but for which I don't have definitive answer. Um, and I want to, before I end, just ask one adjacent question that maybe we can do the Q&A. Um, it's a question that I've been puzzling over and that I hope we can talk about um, in the conversational part of the panel. It sort of alludes to the politics that we spoke about in the previous panel, the politics around abolition. So. The Constitution evokes the notion of a sovereign, and yet many workers in my research and throughout our service economy are undocumented and are simultaneously involved in movements for economic justice that are linked to struggles to abolish borders. So how do we think about constitutionalism in relationship to global economic fairness, to neocolonialism, to the relationship between racialized extraction both within and we do these things, where does the theory of constitutional political economy point these movement actors who are engaging in all of these spaces? And how do we think about the imperatives of internationalism, if I may say, um, through a constitutional lens? Is that possible? Thank you. And now, uh, Catherine Kiss. Hi. It's wonderful to be here uh, talking about Constitutions and Constitutionalism. I'm Catherine Fisk. I teach labor law and employment law, some other things here, but not constitutional law. Um, and I'm a skeptic about constitutionalism as a strategy for progressivism, but I'll explain why. I had a nightmare last night. I know you won't believe me because this nightmare is too on the nose for the theme <laughs> of this uh, conference, but it's true. I was in a kitchen adjoining, but outside a room in which a group of men were sitting around a table discussing how to eliminate women's reproductive freedom. The men in the room were a mix of right-wing activists, but a lot of constitutional scholars, <laughs> including my spouse. <laughs> <laughs> I was there to bring them ginger ale, and I was furious. Uh, I went into the meeting room intending to yell at them, except my voice was so hoarse they couldn't hear me. I pointed out that I'm a mother uh, and that I had an abortion after I decided with four children at home I could not manage anything else. And that a small group of men had no right to tell all the women in the country who are a majority what they can do with their bodies and their lives. One of the men, not my spouse happily, <laughs> <laughs> made a patronizing remark about how I didn't know what I was talking about because this was constitutional law, patted me on the head and sent me back to the kitchen. Talk about marginalization of the care economy. 
And as I reflected on what this meant, it had to do with being a labor person, which was a has been a very marginalized field for a long time, my entire professional career. Talking about constitutionalism, which is where all the hotshot dudes when I was in law school uh, went to talk to the hotshot male faculty. So what does this have to do with labor's constitutional vision? First, I wanna begin by thinking about what we gain when we talk about political economy in terms of a constitutional vision. I'm not sure I understand really what a constitution is, um, but it tends to connote unchangeability except by supermajorities. Constitutions connote rights, both negative, freedom from, and positive, rights to. Constitutions, of course, have to do with the structure of government. Um, constitution, at least in the American tradition, connotes restrictions on state power. And in the last century, constitutional rights have been conceptualized mainly as minority rights. Jim Pope is the great expert on labor's constitutional vision, and so I'll let him talk about it. But to the extent that labor has a constitutional vision, it hasn't focused much on any of that. But labor does and always has had a vision of what law could do to create a just political economy. Negative rights have always been an important part of that. They've always been a short-term goal and they remain so freedom of speech and association. And although the First Amendment has, is not popular among the progressive left these days, I actually dissent from that position because I believe there is no path to labor power but through movement activism. And movement activism requires free speech. Another labor right that's crucially important, as we heard in the last session, is freedom from police harassment. Labor also has theories about the structure of governance. Um, it has historically been a majority rule, a genuine majority rule governance, not the oligarchical rule we have now and that we have always had. And of course, it always has meant majority rule within whatever institution workers are laboring in, which could be the workplace, it could be the municipality, it could be the state, it could be the nation, it could be the world. And of course, labor has always believed in positive rights, a legal framework that promotes or indeed mandates co-determination of the production of goods and services, which notwithstanding the NLRA, we've never really had. A positive rights conception of property rights that recognize that corporate property is not the purview of the C-suite, but rather is the shared property of all who work in and for the organization. And of course, positive rights that labor has fought for, protected by statute, whether it is the right to organize and bargain collectively, um, the right to a safe workplace through OSHA, the right to freedom of discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender, match origin, et cetera. Um, the Social Security Act, which was enacted without labor input, and it shows, but all sorts of statutes that promote economic justice. And yet labor's constitutional vision, if you wanna call it that, has been stunted because every branch of government, courts, legislatures, the executive, and at all levels of government, local, state, national, have been so unremittingly hostile to workers for the entirety of American history. But let's focus just on when many people, myself included, think that the opportunity that labor had created for itself through the organizing of the 1930s and 40s uh, was stopped in its tracks. 
the United Auto Workers and many CIO unions between 1939 and 1947 used the power workers had gained through organizing multiracial uh, industry-wide organizations to promote a robust vision of social democracy. It's forgotten, but they really did have a vision about how after World War II, the extensive government management of the economy, which of course was daily familiar to workers because they had been working for companies that were making super competitive profits because of government contracts to make war material. They weren't making Fords for people. They were making Jeeps and planes for the US armed services. They thought that the, since the US government was controlling the economy and they had been producing for the economy at personal sacrifice, it was time for the government to turn the economy into peacetime uses that would benefit the broad working class um, on a broad multiracial basis. And then what happened? Peacetime conversion famously led to mass layoffs that hit female and black workers especially hard. The last hired were the first fired. Governments at the federal and state level had no appetite for social democracy, not for finishing the unfinished work of the Social Security Act for the most, most part, nor for extending other New Deal programs. And then business used the specter of communism to break the labor, labor coalition and labor let it happen. Um, the CIO abandoned Operation Dixie, which was labor's best hope that for the first time in American history, business would stop playing off the white and the black working class and threatening to move unionized jobs from the upper Midwest and the Northeast to the non-union Southeast and Southwest. Um, the CIO purged 11 progressive unions and the surviving CIO unions, including the United Auto Workers, purged the leftists from within. And then of course the government viciously and vigorously fanned out across the country to prosecute leftist activists, including labor activists, labor lawyers under the Smith Act, um, and everybody was convicted and many went to jail, including their lawyers. Um, so that's one of the reasons, and of course, <laughs> the Constitution did nothing to stop this. Even the progressive so-called on the court turned pale, Labor had a constitutional right to picket for three years or two, depending on how you count, from 1939 and 1940 until 1941 or 42, when the Supreme Court stopped protecting the right to picket or boycott. And labor has never regained that as a constitutional right Civil rights activism in the 1960s gained it for civil rights organize, organizations, but labor, labor organizations do not now and never have had a constitutional right to boycott. Only civil rights organizations do or religious organizations do. And although I've been saying it's time to hold the Supreme Courts and the federal courts feet to the fire and require a little income, a little intellectual honesty by challenging the prohibitions on labor engaging in secondary boycotts that civil rights organizations are allowed to do. Uh, labor lawyers are terrified to do so and for good reason. And so labor remains really leery of constitutionalism for all of those reasons. Not even the first amendment works for them. <laughs> And of course, 
as Vina just explained, um, labor remains terrified and is growing more afraid of constitutionalism as it's currently understood by uh, constitutional law scholars under the other uh, amendments as well. The 13th Amendment has done nothing for workers, as Jim has shown, um, and the other Reconstruction era amendments are now being chipped away at. Vina talked about Olson, and I had intended to talk about it, but since she did it so beautifully, I won't elaborate, other than to say that the constitutional challenge that is being made against Proposition 22 is being made in the register of the California State Constitution which has one of the few positive rights for workers that exists in a state constitution. Uh, it's the provision of the California constitution adopted in the progressive era that requires the California legislature to maintain a complete and adequate system of workers' compensation. That provision is in the California Constitution because after California first adopted a workers comp system, the courts were hostile to it and declared it in part unconstitutional and then chipped away at it. Uh, and so the legislature, so, so the people through constitutional amendment requires the legislature to maintain a complete and adequate system. And the argument is, is that Proposition 22, by carving app-based drivers out of the workers' comp system, along with all other uh, minimum labor standards in the state, violates the state constitution by depriving the legislature of its plenary authority, constitutionally mandated to maintain a complete and adequate system of workers' compensation system. One could read Assembly Bill 5, which is the one uh, that the Ninth Circuit found unconstitutional in part in Olson, uh, as being the legislature making good on its constitutional obligation to extend workers' comp as well as other protections to uh, app-based drivers along with all the other misclassified workers in the state. The Uber-Lyft attack thus on protections for workers is both two-pronged. Proposition 22, using, of course, the progressive era initiative mm -hmm. um, to, as a device to undermine protections from workers, carved their workforce out of all the other statutory rights. Um, and lest you think Proposition 22 was anomalous, uh, there is another ballot measure that has just qualified for the ballot promoted by the National Restaurant Association, the other NRA, and the International Franchise uh, Association, the Trade Association of Franchise Businesses, especially fast food, um, to invalidate a state law that would allow for negotiated rulemaking, not exactly a radical concept, in the fast food, fast food sector, because the fast food corporations are that terrified at the prospect of doing the only thing that the statute requires, which is that they sit down with representatives of their workers, representatives of their franchisees, and some state rep labor representatives, as well as a representative of the governor's business office, which is no friend of labor actually, to talk about wages and working conditions. So there's uh, the initiative process, clearly has been captured by business. And then of course, the second prong of the attack on labor rights launched and funded by Uber and Lyft is as Vina described, the litigation challenging AB5. Um, so I count me skeptical about what it would take to reimagine what a constitution could be, whether it's the structure of government, whether it's negative rights, whether it's positive rights, um, or whether it's even what it means to have equal protection of the law. 
um, whether that will benefit a class-based movement. Um, and of course, the final thing to say is that it's worth reminding ourselves here, we, uh, most of us quite well-paid academics, uh, that the class-based movement that the elite left currently loves to love, myself included, will never be ours in the narrow sense. It won't be ours in the sense in which elites um, and working class people can find interest convergence on issues of race or the gender story that I told to start with. Um, you know, in my nightmare, my anger was about that small group of men in the elite world of constitutionalism um, denigrating me as a woman, as a mom, as a pro-choice feminist, and as an outsider to the rarefied circle of calm law. The labor movement to which I gravitated because it's where I felt at home when I didn't feel at home in the con law group in law school or elsewhere, and I didn't feel truly at home in the identity-based caucuses. Um, I got drummed out of the Women's Law Association because I happen to like James Bond movies. And, <laughs> um, and I, was, I was just a traitor to feminists and, and lesbians everywhere. Um, I think the, the, a truly class-based movement will always have a complex relationship with wealthy intellectuals like us. And I think we have to be prepared for that. And one way of understanding what the Trump campaign has done so well that we have yet figured out how to talk to is how to appeal to them on the basis of, that is the white working class that everybody in the elite sort of is kind of simultaneously terrified of and loves to hate, um, that how we can appeal on a class basis when the right is always better at being cynical uh, than we are. And we are always better at fighting with each other and purging either the moderate left or the elite left, depending on the period in history we're talking about. So I, we have a lot of work to do. And I worry that re-envisioning the constitution as much as I admire Willie and Joey's book and their scholarship and them as people and the project, uh, I'm skeptical about how much we can really succeed in that. Thank you. Is this working? Thank you, just here. Now. Oh, you have to push the button. <laughs> Technologically uh, incompetent. Uh, your nightmare. When I started in the field of labor law many years ago, uh, it was basically an all-male fraternity. Uh, and uh, it was also virtually all white where I was. Uh, the uh, people of color were on management side, uh, generally, because the labor movement was perceived by many people as racist and uh, in spite of the CIO, but uh, women were just missing. And Kathy Stone was the big uh, barrier breaker uh, in legal scholarship. So there, there you go, not just constitutionalism, labor too. Well, uh, what I wanna say is, uh, could be viewed as a continuation of Vina's uh, talk in a way. Um, so the, the panel is about reviving labor constitutionalism. And uh, what, what are we reviving is one question we could start off with. Uh, and as we know from Willie's first book, uh, he, he, this is talking about a very particular tradition. The tradition is of the labor movement in the early 20th century when the movement claimed the constitutional rights to organize and strike. That's pretty far from socialist constitutionalism, which Willie really panel about uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, it's a limited program, but what 
distinguished it is it is its intensity. That is the big thing that the labor movement did that most other segments of the constitutional program that fit under the big tent of anti-oligarchy constitutionalism, what, what they didn't do, that the labor movement did do, was exercise direct power. Uh, and uh, so they exercised their rights in defiance of court injunctions, in defiance of legislative acts. They were not trying to get official recognition. They were trying to exercise power against who? Against capitalists. So uh, labor's constitutionalism is different in other ways from the other subject matter areas that are covered by anti-oligarchy constitutionalism. It's about the working class. Uh, and you know, I, asked, I sort of provocatively asked a question, what happened to the working class this morning? Uh, and it was very much there. It's very much there in anti-oligarchy constitutional, but it's not a central theme. What you really see most of the time is middle class. There's the middle class. And what is the middle class? Well, number one, it's not a class. It's a status group. How do you get into middle class? Uh, you're, you're higher than the lower class and lower than the higher class. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's always how you're defined relative to other. And the only way to get uh, out of that and still use the term middle class is to say middle classes, in which case you can be talking about segments of real classes, real classes being defined by their position in a structure. That's uh, what distinguishes a class. And a class can rise as a whole because the class in its structural position can gain power. Whereas usually if you rise and the equal opportunity emphasis of anti-oligarchy constitutionalism stresses this, you rise out of the middle class. You're not trying to, you have no class consciousness as a middler, but you do as a worker. You're somebody who produces. The working class is broad. It consists of everybody who has nothing to sell but their labor power. And that extends down to the bottom. Uh, today, a lot of people in this economy, uh, capitalists don't even want their labor. And that's why so many of them end up in prison. And when they get in prison, they become sources of, uh, for exploitation in, in many ways other than labor. I mean, they do get exploited for labor, but that's really only a, a small part of it. They get exploited for all kinds of stuff. Um, so it includes the unemployed because you're still somebody who has nobody to sell but your labor power. It's just that you can't even find a buyer for the labor for, for your labor power. And it includes elites like tool and die makers and university professors who have nothing to sell but their labor power, although a lot of university professors think that they're secure because they're in places like the University of California at Berkeley, instead of at places where the uh, academic workforce is part of the precariat. Another difference is that labor's constitution is centered on the workplace. The workplace is a place where workers come together and thanks to the victories of the civil rights movement, that means now it is one of the most unsegregated spaces in American society. So it's where people come together. It's where you can develop cross-racial solidarity, the best single location. And you can do it in combination with uh, people of different colors and races from your own uh, in action. And the final feature of Labor's Constitution that I'll mention that's different from the other ones is it's built around the action of oppressed people. That is, labor's constitution was developed to justify activities that workers were anyway, like organizing and striking. And I want to just for a moment here differentiate between the so-called 
labor movement, which glosses over an important distinction, I, I think it's important really theoretically at least to call it a workers movement. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with employee status. It's people who have nothing to sell but their labor power, whether they do whatever form they do it in. But also uh, so-called unions are not necessarily workers organizations. I mean, they are, but, but they're also quote unquote labor organizations under the Taft-Hartley Act and labor organizations under the Taft-Hartley Act uh, are distinct from unions generally as associations of workers in many ways. Uh, I can't begin to go into it, but I just want to say that labor organizations are shaped by their position in the law, which is set up to block solidarity. Okay, so this is the current events portion of the panel. <laughs> so uh, our union is on strike uh, and our strike is puny compared to the University of California strike. We only have 7,000 workers involved, but it's an interesting strike because it's uh, unique and our union is unique in that we are wall to wall, which means we have uh, all of the teaching workers in the university, that is uh, faculty, grad workers, postdocs, part-time lecturers, adjuncts, and our strike is a, is a solidarity strike because the full-time faculty understands that the big issue in the strike is the adjunct faculty or part-time faculty and grad workers also, but they've gotten some gains in the past. It's really the, the adjuncts that are totally screwed. So what does this have to do with reviving labor's constitution? Well, it seemed like this strike was gonna be the perfect test case for labor's constitution. Under New Jersey common law strikes are unlawful and can be enjoined, usually are, within hours at the uh, petition of the employer. So what do you do? You either roll over and play dead or labor's constitution. The injunction is unconstitutional, but we didn't go that way even though a certain person was involved in the legal planning right from the outset, who's been spouting about this stuff for four decades. <laughs> Why not? Well, Occam's razor suggests because he just fucking blew it. But I don't wanna go that way and I'm in control <laughs> until my minutes are up. And so I'm going to say in a soundbite, international standards beat out the Constitution. Uh, and uh, so this is, it's simple. Why? They have a big advantage. They're clear. Uh, at, at least, uh, I mean, you can point to paragraphs 845 to 847 of the uh, ILO Committee on Freedom of Association uh, compendium. Uh, we are not, quote unquote, essential workers whose rights, right to strike can be denied. This is easy. It gets in an outside source. It's established. It's a blue ribbon source. It's tripartite. It's employers, government, and uh, unions. And it's irresistible when you're way behind on picket captains. And that's uh, something that happens to the labor movement all the time in this area. So, what are we going to do to get labor's constitution going? Because it's immensely stronger than international standards. Number one, employers have finally woken up and they figured out standards have gone against them and they're trying to erode them and they could easily win. You know, an officially recognized standard can go away, whereas labor's constitution is incredibly resistant to outside forces. 
It defies courts. It defies legislatures. It defies everybody. It defies the capitalists. Uh, so what we have to do is generate, as Vina says, a uh, culture, uh, a culture of constitutionalism. And that can't be done in the short term. And it can't be done through the typical way that Taft-Hartley labor organizations think about organizing which is we're gonna do a campaign, we're gonna uh, roll it out, we're gonna get the workers involved, blah, 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 blah. We, who's we? Union staffers, uh, people on the union payroll. These are, a lot of these people are really great people. I'm not cutting them down at all. I work with them. I'm, uh, I'm a great admirer of Stoughton Lind, uh, on the other hand, who thought unions were just a total obstacle Taft-Hartley labor organizations, that is. But I sympathize with Staunton a lot when I see what happens. So uh, missed opportunities, and I got to wrap it up. Uh, 2002, Middletown, New Jersey. A, a judge enjoins a teacher strike, and he gets the teachers into court, and each, he, each one of them stands up, and he says, you go to jail or you go back to work and each one of them says, I'm doing nothing wrong. And they go to jail and the strike is broken. And the left wing of the labor movement in New Jersey organized into something called the Industrial Union uh, Council. We tried to get into the National Education Association that was running the strike. They wouldn't do anything. We said, it's the 13th Amendment. It's involuntary servitude. You can't give somebody the choice of going to jail or going back to work. Not interested. 2005, Transport Workers Local 100 goes out on New York City. All the liberals, a lot of whom are, you know, probably with a lot of anti-oligarchy constitution, they don't like it because they can't get to work conveniently because the transport workers are on strike and the subways aren't running. And all of a sudden, you know, it's, uh, it, well, a lot of stuff happened there. Uh, I don't have time, but uh, bottom line, uh, in spite of Roger Toussaint standing up and saying, Rosa Parks also uh, defied the law, and we're like Rosa Parks. Nevertheless, the strike was legally suppressed, and the labor movement barely anything out of them and not anything on labor's constitution. These are the kinds of things, these are the kinds of moments where workers are doing things where if the labor movement wants to develop a uh, constitutional political economy, it's gonna have to step in and build it on those actions. It's gonna have to take advantage of those, back those people up. There are lots of other examples. And thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Diana Reddy. Um, I am also delighted to be here for this um, exercise in culture change um, that we are all a part of. Um, I've been inspired by my co-panelists to start with a personal story um, about how I ended up coming back to after working at. Um, so I in early 2010s, I was a labor lawyer, um, first working at Altruler Burzon. I know we have someone from that firm here today, um, and then in-house with the California Teachers Association. And during that time, um, Gibson and Dunn brought a lawsuit ostensibly on behalf of poor black and brown school children, challenging teacher protections in the education code as unconstitutional because they protected grossly ineffective teachers. They called them GITs, G-I-T. Um, and deprived um, poor black and brown children um, of uh, uh, their right to education under the California constitution. Um, uh, it was a pu publicity stunt when they survived the motion for summary judgment. You could tell their, their lawyers were as shocked as everyone else. Um, and it did spur, as, as research shows, um, litigation um, gets media coverage, litigation um, for, uh, you know, its pluses and minuses, uh, a social movement tactic. Um, and so during this time, um, you know, this image is burned in my brain. There was the, the Time Magazine article on the front of it. They showed a rotting apple. 
um, and it discussed the Vergara lawsuit um, and the kind of you know rotting of our education system, ostensibly due to teacher unions and teacher worker protections. Um, as we strategized in house about how to respond um, to this lawsuit. Um, we, uh, we engaged with outside counsel, um, uh, my former firm, and we were, um, notwithstanding those of us in-house who said, this is about, um, this is about discourse. This is not just a, a legal strategy. This is a, um, a culture change strategy and we need to respond in turn. We were convinced that the best argument that we should make was that there isn't a right to a quality education under the California constitution. And so that is what we led with in our brief. Um, and we won, um, but not uh, on appeal. Um, but when the California Supreme Court decided not to review it, um, Goodwin Liu um, authored, um, this was an important civil rights issue um, and that he would have considered um, uh, the arguments. Um, and so that is what triggered the crisis that led me back to academia. I wanted to know, how can we be here? How can an organization um, that itself, uh, at least at minimum, understands itself to be advancing the rights of working class people, of poor people, of school children, um, of workers and their families, um, be defending a, a lawsuit like this? Um, and why don't we have a language for responding, a language that both could win in courts, um, but more importantly, could win in courts of public opinion? Um, and so when I came um, to this incredible book, um, it was uh, psychologically healing. Um, it was a, a story um, that helped make sense of my own experiences as a labor lawyer, feeling like I couldn't say the most important um, because the language for expressing what I wanted to express um, had, had been forgotten. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't want to talk a, a ton. Um, I want to make sure we have time for, for discussion. Um, but my own research um, tracks uh, a lot uh, with what, um, you know, Willie and Joey have done here. Um, and one of my recent articles talks about the role that law has played, and particularly a constitutional paradigm that I call the law of a political economy, because catchy titles are everything in law review articles. Um, the role that this has played in, in obfuscating the normative stakes of, of labor unions. Um, and so I, I, many of you, I've, I've I've talked about this paper innumerable times in the past nine months. Um, so many of you may have heard it, I'll, I'll, I'll... Um, but my general argument is that, you know, historically the labor movement um, made really rich and robust normative arguments um, that engaged with kind of core American ideals and legal ideals, ideas of labor republicanism, industrial democracy, um, and, and I think it's important that the labor problem that everyone was discussing in the progressive era was not just a problem of, you know, it wasn't just an economic problem. It was a it was a problem of, of democracy. Right. How do we have um, meaningful equality and citizen in an economic system that renders one group permanently subordinate to another group? Um, and as Jim Pope has has written the most beautiful work on um, uh, labor unionist workers um, started invoking the language of rights as well um, under the first 13th and 14th amendments. Uh, the 1914 Clayton Antitrust Act said that the labor of a human being is not a commodity or article of commerce. Um, so there was this vision of uh, what workers, uh, claims of justice for workers are about human rights. Um, what I argue is that in the wake of the Great Depression, however, um, there was a substantial move, particularly among policy um, elites, um, to think about what labor unions do in a new way as good economic policy. Um, at this time, there was an increase, there was a rise of what would come to be called uh, Keynesian economics, um, which said that uh, the ravages of the Great Depression had been caused in part by um, too much concentration of wealth at the top. Um, uh, this was a demand side vision. We needed uh, for the economy to be stable, for the economy to grow, for capitalism to succeed. 
um, people needed to buy stuff and for that they needed income. Um, and so, you know, Joel Rogers, a legal scholar, has referred to the alchemy of Keynesianism in linking um, in, in rendering what unions do as a common good because it made what unions do for their members ostensibly also good for the economy as a whole, good for all of us. Um, and so there's this really important moment uh, during the new it reflected in the in the preamble to the National Labor Relations Act, where there's this juxtaposition of kind of competing understandings of what are unions and why are we why are we um, enacting laws that, that ostensibly support them? Um, so there's this reference to the inequality of bargaining power between employees who not possess full freedom of association or actual liberty of contract. Um, you know, uh, those are constitutional terms. Um, but that's not the, the intervention of the act is not premised on those. Those kind of hidden in a subordinate clause. Um, the intervention of the act is premised on um, wanting to prevent burdens um, to commerce and um, preventing recurrent business depressions. Um, this is partly strategic, right? The the act is framed as an exercise of the commerce clause, but it also reflects a real time change in how many policy elites. Um, understood what labor unions uh, were about and why we should support them, why law should support them. Um, so in there's a really interesting moment in 1937 when the Supreme Court upholds the constitutionality of the National Labor Relations Act, um, in which kind of this um, dual understanding of unions as good economic policy, but also furthering really important normative purposes coexists. Um, this is the Jones and Laughlin case. And so here the Supreme Court says, yes, this, uh, this act is constitutional as an exercise of the Commerce Clause because strikes and other labor unrest um, impact the, the stream of commerce. They also say, um, and this is something that Jim has emphasized, that there is a fundamental right to self-organization and to select representatives um, and for employees to select representatives of their own choosing for collective bargaining and other mutual protection. Um, you know, talking about the diff, uh, you know constitutional paradigms, it's really interesting here. The court doesn't name where they rise. Um, they, they don't get to the level of constitutional rule, um, but they are certainly working within um, a paradigm at minimum where it is possible to understand that this is a fundamental right. These are private sector workers, really. Like, where did that fundamental right come from? But the Supreme Court said it. Um, what I think is really important and what I want to emphasize here um, is that the next year, the court issues its decision in Caroline Products, um, which I think broadly understood as setting forth the jurisprudential framework for judicial review post Lochner. And in it, they say ordinary commercial transactions um, should be not be are not to be pronounced unconstitutional. Um, unless the assumption that it base it um, rests upon the rational basis. Um, within the knowledge and experience of the legislatures is rebutted. In so doing, there's an attempt to carve out economic regulation um, as separate and apart from other political issues. Um, and importantly, not just to say that they are, uh, you know, categorically distinct, but that they should be governed by different logics. So uh, economic legislation is based on, uh, should be based on a rational decision making within the knowledge and experience of the legislature. So is fairness um, such, a, such a basis? Is, um, is morality, is um, fundamental values and commitments uh, a, a rational basis? Is a, is a tweet of disgust based on um, the, uh, the aggregation of wealth through a conspiracy to evade labor and employment laws? Um, is that a rational basis? Um, and so I, uh, I think there's, I mean, within our world, the LP world, there's a ton of emphasis on, on the role of Caroline products. Um, but I've written specifically about how I think it shifts co uh, constitutional conceptions of what labor unions are and what they do. Um, and in turn, broader cultural understanding of what labor unions are and what they do. Um, and, and importantly, I really focus on uh, the language of rights itself. Um, so with, um, it, within the sociology of social movements, there's a real emphasis on the importance of rights as, as a discourse. Um, and the 1950s, 1960s are understood as a moment of, you know, the rights revolutions, 
Um, and at that time, rights are the language of um, social movement claims making. Um, and of course, this is exactly at the moment in which what labor unions are doing has been constructed as not about rights. Um, and so then you see that labor unions can be labor unions can be um, intersectional with rights issues. They can inhibit civil rights. They can further civil rights. Um, but partly through um, the law of a political economy, there is no longer an understanding of what labor unions are doing um, as itself a matter of rights. Um, and so I, I, I'll fast forward to, um, to the present day and why I think this matters so much. Um, uh, through the law of a political economy, I argue we have lost many of the most compelling arguments for what, um, for what labor unions do, the most compelling normative arguments. Um, this worked for a while because they still had the economic arguments. Um, but with the, the sh paradigm shift of the 1970s and 1980s in economic thinking, um, it radically changes how we understand um, the economics of what labor unions do. Um, so from, a again, under the Keynesian demand side view, labor unions, all of us, because they increased purchasing power um, under the, the supply side, neoliberal, um, you know, trickle down economics view. Um, what's good for corporations, what's good for employers is good for all of us. They are the job creators. Um, they are the innovators. They are the ones who produce wealth and anything that um, makes it harder for them to be flexible, nubile, um, productive is bad for all of us. And in that way, unions become a economic um, pariah. Um, previously, again, in the preamble to the NLRA, um, there was an understanding that they were both economic policy and a matter of fundam fundamental rights. Um, but uh, the law of a political economy helped um, facilitated a great forgetting um, of things like actual liberty of contract and full freedom of association. Um, and the neoliberal turn um, facilitated a great, forg a great forgetting of the economic arguments that once labor unions were considered good economic policy. Um, if you want to know how I became interested in this topic, it was through reading uh, you know, partly the, the the preamble to the NLRA and some uh, and as someone who took Econ 101 at Stanford with John Taylor, advisor to um, to George Bush, uh, I, I was absolutely shocked um, that that at one point uh, unions were thought of as good for the economy. Um, but yes, there's been so much forgetting. Um, so I also in the I also in my research talk about the past 10 years, because notwithstanding a, a crisis, I'd say, in union legitimacy in 2009, um, when I was litigating on behalf of, of labor unions, um, it was the lowest level of public support for unions in American history. Um, the past decade, however, has seen a really sharp increase in public support for labor unions. Um, but what some of my research shows is that perhaps it's not as robust as we might uh, hope uh, hope it is, um, hope it should be, um, because through, uh, th so through, a, through a survey experiment, um, when I exposed respondents to a frame that said, unions are fantastic because they help workers organize to have better jobs, support for labor unions went down. Um, and so I treat that as partly the legacy of um, the law of a political economy that in this moment of kind of social unrest, we support unions or there is interest in labor unions as kind of a, um, you know, a, an empty signifier um, of, of, of uh, fighting um, all of the things that, that we are fighting, but that when it comes down to really talking about improving workers' livelihoods, we're not sure yet how we think about that. Um, so I conclude the paper with a with a kind of you know thought experiment. What would happen if we were to return to actual liberty of contract and full freedom of association? Um, but one of the great things about being an academic is you don't necessarily have to commit to any to anything. And so I say maybe I don't know. But so here I just want to conclude with I think kind of laying out some of the costs of this bifurcation of economic issues from other social political issues that we do conceive of as rights. Um, so again, I think what's so interesting is just the extent to which the law of a political economy has obfuscated not just constitutional argumentation, but I think to a large extent, any really robust normative argumentation about the value of labor unions. 
and I think to some of the, like to the point of some of the earlier discussions, um, our some of our most powerful normative discourses they're constitutional. They may not be constitutional rules, but they are the language that um, that is used. And it's uh, you know in this fantastic book, there's a reference to um, the Supreme Court's decision in Janus and the incredibly you know ar the beautiful arguments made by the majority about. Um, how, uh, you know, the freedom um, of speech um, that has been denied to union objectors. Um, and in the dissent, uh, Justice Kagan says, but the agency fee clause, the, an agency fee clause might facilitate peaceful and stable labor relations. Um, and so there's just an extent to which by not engaging in um, by, by actually stifling kind of this broader sense of what a labor unions do. It's not just that we don't have constitutional arguments. I feel like it has inhibited kind of any really creative thought about um, uh, normative, uh, like normative defense of what the core purposes of labor unions. Um, another downside is that it has uh, bifurcated what I see as inherently interconnected issues and uh, resulting in an untenable line drawing between unions and social movements and between rights and economics. Um, numerous times today, I, I, I've heard folks and I know it's it, it's just the language we use because I know everyone here is critical of the of the division of economics from other forms of life. But here we still say economics versus. Um, and uh, ultimately, I think that's a distinction that uh, that doesn't serve any of the causes that um, the, those of us here are concerned about. Um, and finally, uh, to, to bring it back home, I, I think one of the causes has been um, uh, a loss of the incredible power of law schools and legal scholars. These are places of culture change for better or for worse. These are places in which future policymakers, justices, judges, um, politicians are trained. Um, and for a very long time, uh, for the past decades, there hasn't been a lot of discussion of, uh, of labor law. It's largely been taught by adjuncts. Um, it has not been understood as a matter of constitutional importance whereas other uh, important social movements have been, um, and so have been um, uh, centered in kind of core uh, service courses. Um, and I think that matters. I also think it matters because we have, we get a dehistoric, a dehistoricized de vision of how we got here. Um, you know, there's the idea that the constitution is inherently hostile, that courts are institutionally hostile, maybe, um, or are they fields of institutional power that are subject to contestation, like all fields of institutional power. Um, it was interesting to hear, you know, the Warren court um, described as a blip in history. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I um, as a labor person, I am well aware that courts have been really at the same time, I think it's really important to emphasize the, the socio-historic specificity of each of these periods. The jurists of the 1950s and 1960s, they went to law school in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. They were socialized into legal culture by legal realists, um, uh, and they learned about the law in a very different way than the, the justices and judges that uh, have power today who went to law school in the 1980s um, and learned something very different about the role of law um, and about the inequalities that are redressable through law. Um, when we talk about the the, diff the changing um, uh, fate of, of abortion within um, constitutional jurisprudence, um, uh, one of our fantastic JSP scholars, Kristen Luker, has documented the incredible effort, the incredible organizing by conservatives to creating um, uh, to to uh, to fight back against the rights that we that um, that were created through Roe versus Wade. So I just think it's really important not to essentialize um, uh, outcomes that are the result of decades of um, political and social mobilization. So the Supreme Court in 1937 said that workers have a fundamental right to organize and collectively bargain. And what is so important about that is that it was those who most believed in the importance of that who said, 
let's not let courts get into the business of, of this, who deconstitutionalized it in order to save it. Um, it has not been saved. Um, ultimately, I, you know, as a social, I think if you read a lot in social movement literature, it's, it just emphasizes that you need to be active in all fronts. And I, I think the story of the labor movement is hoping against hope that we could just carve ourselves out. And if we just built power over here, then no one would bother us. Um, the second you build power, you will be bothered. Um, and so, you know, we don't, we, we want power, but we need legitimacy for that power. And it's hard to imagine a robust legitimacy for what the labor movement does that doesn't involve constitutional argumentation. Um, I'll conclude with one more personal story. Um, the Glacier Northwest case that's currently under consideration by the Supreme Court about whether workers should be liable in tort um, for stopping work uh, in a concerted way. Um, of course, conservatives in that case make an argument, they make a statutory interpretation also make constitutional arguments. They're a stretch, um, but you know the that uh, reading the NLRA to to protect this kind of activity um, and to deny employers uh, a tort remedy for their lost profits um, would be an unconstitutional taking. Um, ludicrous today, the law of the land in ten years. Um, there are, of course, other constitutional um, implications for this. Uh, a finding that workers have a duty to their employers that is ongoing, that they can face massive liability for stopping work whenever they choose. Um, that sounds like it has 13th Amendment implications to me, maybe not as a matter of rule, but as a matter of um, paradigm. And I, uh, I mentioned my, that that's what immediately came to me as I read it. And I talked to my old friend at the AFL-CIO and he said, thank God you're going to be a law professor and you're not a lawyer anymore because we never want to make that argument. Um, and I talked to, to Pam Carlin, whose um, clinic at Stanford helped, um, helped write the brief. Um, and she said that she desperately wanted to include a footnote about the 13th Amendment implications um, of chilling workers' right to stop working. And she said that, you know, all the good liberals around her said, no, you know, heaven forbid we write that footnote. Um, and so I think it's when we talk about what is possible, it's really just important to remember that we're, we haven't tried. Um, and so I'm grateful for this call on us to um, consider trying. Okay. So uh, I don't want to take time away from discussion, but I do want to acknowledge that many of these were discouraging to a certain extent, but also pointing to lost opportunities. So I want to come back to the idea and, and maybe move it, although I know that labor and um, uh, labor union organizing has been the primary way of thinking about this. But if we were to move this into that protect workers in whatever form, uh, what would that look like? And uh, what would be the mechanism or the method for making that a constitutional conversation, whether big C or little c? So questions, comments, laments? Yeah, um, I think that that's a really interesting point on that front. I was sort of wondering um, like how people on the panel are thinking about the possibility of making our, like, constitutional arguments about um, labor rights in front of courts that are very hostile. Like, for example, my old boss, David Rosenfeld, formed the Committee to Preserve the Religious Right to Organize, I think, like 10 years ago, and he just files ULP charges saying that anything that stops people from organizing is violating that, that religious right. He, he's been struggling to find a potential plaintiff for it, but, and it never works. I mean, it just, it fails every time, but and so that could be sort of like a publicity stunt like Diana was talking about was being used on the other side. But it also, I'm curious if, if you think that um, legal strategies like that, like the 13th Amendment thing, maybe like a secondary activity pr prohibitions, if things like that are worthwhile to kind of change this conversation, even when courts are presumably very hostile to that type of argument these days. Yeah. 
me pick up one more question or comment over here and then we can bring it back for the panel. Um, yeah, I had a different different part of the Constitution. I was hoping to maybe to hear a little more about taking um, and whether that could be flipped in the opposite direction, um, given I feel like there's a strong argument that one's labor is one's property. Um, and it's also, I've been thinking about this in relation to the non proposed non-compete ban, um, that at the time that the FTC Act was passed, um, it was uh, Supreme Court doctrine that yeah, restrictions on alienation are uh, per se anti-competitive and that so there's really a strong argument in favor of the constitutionality of the non-compete ban. But I'm wondering if that can be flipped or if takings is, is a, but also I'd love to hear thoughts on whether takings is a great danger to the labor movement, Peter Point and, and other things we've heard about. Thank you. Maybe I'll take the privilege of having the mic in my hand to just throw out a third one, which is Taft-Hartley, isn't that labor's negative constitution? I mean, it, it's a statute, but it, it's so entrenched that it feels like a constitutional framework that disempowers labor. And of course, the Democratic Party, having been in power numerous times since Taft-Hartley has passed, has never chosen to remove it, which suggests that it's being treated as if it has a constitutional dimension. Why don't we go back to the panel and then... Whoever wants to start, can start. Um, yes, yeah, so I, um, yes, I think that we can make all of these arguments and we should be making all these arguments. I'm not sure that we should be making, um, but I think that we absolutely, and this is part of sort of what I was, what I was saying, um, is that we should be making them as, um, as law professors, um, and who define what is possible. Um, and as um, and as movement actors, um, as elite movement actors, I think that these are really important. And what is what again I find um, hopeful and exciting about this book is, um, you know, in the very beginning you kind of lay out uh, the, the hostile court and the New Deal era and how um, and how things flipped both structurally and um, and constitutionally and how much. Uh, how much of that was rooted both in dissents, um, but also in, in social and labor movements. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I, I really agree with Diana and, and so much as articulating that a lot of this um, elite talk matters. Um, but I also want, I wanna say something a little bit different. I don't know if this is a, a good opportunity to say it, but that, that really brings out something that, um, that Jim pointed out um, I too am I'm a, a big fan of, of Stoughton. And when I met him, he actually talked to me about, about Jim. And so I think that that um, <laughs> admiration was deeply mutual. Um, but I, I think about, and this goes back to my comments about uh, sort of internationalism. I think about two things. One, um, how the AFL-CIO played a role um, via the Solidarity Center in undermining social move, socialist movements in Central favor of an industrial form of, of, um, of labor relations related to sort of the Keynesian compact, uh, compact? Keynesian, co Keynesian co yeah. Um, and, and how we can think about that, uh, what does that mean? What does that say? Um, but also, you know, also thinking internationally, I think a lot about the fees must fall campaign in 2000 Africa. Now this is one of the only examples of unbelievable um, university and service worker organizing that have been successful in the neoliberal era on a large scale. And th the organizers have said that the success of that movement was attributable to three things. Um, one, that they did not allow the rules of engagement, that is the law, to um, uh, they, did, they said they did not seek permission. Um, they said that they were committed not to unions as institutions, but to self-organizing and, and democratic structures. And the three, third thing that they said is that it was the fact that the graduate students um, built solidarity with the workers who lost their jobs, with the janitorial workers, the gardeners, with that, that that is what led to, I mean, there was violent repression, um, but in the end, uh, um, a, a, a really remarkable outcome. And I think that that says that, you know, we need to make more than 
and, um, and sort of the, the constitutional arguments, but also um, I, I heard Willie Burden, uh, you heard it too, on the, on, we heard it a, lot, a couple of weeks ago, this is a Teamsters attorney, this is an attorney for the Teamsters said, we need to act without the law. And, um, and I just, it was so beautiful and powerful. So both sides there. Yeah, I think to the questions of, yes, we should be making these arguments. We will lose in courts in the near term, but labor, and it's a question uh, for organizers, I think more than for me about where the right place is to make the argument. I think I'm with Pam. I would have wanted the 13th Amendment footnote. Yeah. Um, simply because you have to keep saying this is a vision of the law for it to become real. Labor has always done that. During the sit-down strikes uh, in 1937, uh, Morris Sugar, who became the general counsel of the United Auto Workers, wrote one of my favorite short papers uh, published in the masses arguing that worker occupation of the factories was legal, that he had a conception of property rights that said, look, this is our factory. It's not Alfred P. Sloan's factory. It's not the shareholders of General Motors. It's ours. And whether you make that argument in a magazine or whether you make it to a group of workers to say, and here's why we should sit down. Um, you know, the United Farm Workers did it over and over again and really well. Um, Jerry Cohen, the general counsel of the United Farm Workers, and obviously they weren't the only ones who did it. When the growers got an injunction, yet another injunction against the United Farm Workers doing whatever it was they were doing, bullhorns, striking, picketing, um, you know, the standard tactic was to pack the courthouse with workers um, precisely so that the if the it went bad legally, at least the workers would understand it wasn't the union, it wasn't the organizers, it wasn't the union lawyers, it was the judge. And it worked. Sometimes the judges were intimidated because, as one judge said, he decided to is, not to issue an injunction because he didn't want it to be another case of goddamn gringo justice. And so when you have effective organizing, whether it's making a takings argument and saying, you know, whatever, the, you know, they can't, ex it's not a taking for the UFW representatives to go on to the grower property to hear the reasons why you should unionize. In fact, it's a denial of First Amendment rights to allow the grower to invade endlessly against unions without the workers being able to hear the countervailing argument, which remember is the only reason why there is a corporate a right of corporate political speech. It's not that corporations are people and have free speech rights. It's the right of voters to hear the relevant information. And so to constantly, whether it's the Fifth Amendment, the 13th, the 14th, the first, to articulate an alternative vision. And I think, you know, lawyers have, as Diana has pointed out so deftly, have sometimes done a disservice by being cowed and leading with what they think is going to be the winning argument. And sure, maybe you have to do that because you have a client and you really have to win this particular case for this reason, but it doesn't mean you can't say all the rest outside of court and we should be saying it in our writing or in our activism all the time. Yeah, I'm writing that down. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, David Rosenfeld was my boss for a while, too. <laughs> David's fearless, uh, and he's been doing this stuff for years. And, uh, you know, a, a big problem we have is that uh, I think it was Steve Skoranek and, and uh, um, Karen Oren, uh, you know, emphasizing that 
Uh, you can have over time, you have things going on different kinds of time schedules. And sometimes major historical events can turn on uh, something's going on in the economy, something else is going on in the polity. Do they jibe together and point in one direction? Do they offset each other? Uh, and often it, it almost seems like chance. And the, the attitude of the legal profession and the attitude of the Taft-Hartley labor organization movement and the attitude of workers uh, are three different things and they go along their tracks. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, Willie and Joey have already got part of the ball rolling here by getting the American Society involved. Uh, yeah. uh, because that's, uh, you know, an organization that isn't just academics and uh, it brings in lawyers and it's got, you know, some uh, way to communicate with the, the legal profession, uh, professional culture. Uh, so that's, that's an excellent step, you know, like the Federalist Society did the other way around. That's part of how we got where we are. Uh, the other problem is in the labor movement, you know, and this is where the, the Taft-Hartley labor organization thing is so terrible because there was this formation called the Labor Party. It existed for a while. Uh, Left-wing unions like the United Electrical Workers, uh, the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers who eventually merged in with the Steel Workers, the United Mine Workers, uh, and some other kick-ass organizations like the California Nurses Association. Um, which is now National Nurses United. And they endorsed a workers' rights project. And the workers' rights project said workers had the 13th Amendment a right to organize and strike. Um, and, but these unions, most of them were Taft-Hartley unions. And the Labor Party had uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of local union affiliates spread out across the country a lot of which were parts of international unions. But the Labor Party respected the power of the national union to control everything. And so when the people who were involved in the Workers' Rights Project, which included me, tried to get something going with the local unions, where the level of interest was kind of more active, actually, than at the national they just sort of, they didn't say no, they just, we just never could do it. And so uh, I think there's got to be, you know, the labor movement, there's got to be a real shift in thinking um, among these Taft-Hartley um, labor leaders. But yeah, get in line, you know, we need <laughs> lawyers like David Rosenfeld. Can we get one more comment or question and do we have time? Yeah, yeah. Great. I, I hesitate okay. to ask. Hi, thank you for a wonderful panel um, filled with passion and insights. Um, I hesitate to ask this question because I also feel like I'm interrupting a little bit uh, a, a lefty labor lawyers kind of therapy session that's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to, I wanted to, but so at the risk of, you know, uh, adding uh, depressive thoughts, I want to come back to Katie's opening remarks, which I thought were very were very provocative and helpful and which didn't then weave their way through as much. Because from the outside, it looks like in some ways what you're all charting is a history of failure and a few green shoots here and there that are giving you hope to keep carrying on. And what KT started with was, and then, and I also heard that a, a fully constitutionalized rights frame, there's good and understandable resistance to that. But what I didn't hear about was political institutions and the possibility of innovating the way in which labor is incorporated into political economy, whether constitutional political economy or something else. Sectoral bargaining, international supply chain link-ups, the gig economy, well, we need to talk about the gig economy, but is the, KT said, is, is something like basically doubling down on the on formal labor side organizing, is that the way forward or something else? You know, paying everybody for activity regardless of that rerouting uh, labor's activity through the care economy, you know, uh, basic income, basic capacities. There's, there's a lot of stuff on the table, all of which is trying to respond to 
the declining share of formal labor's uh, income as a as a as a as part of national production, uh, trying to respond to globalization and lots of different trends. And and it's it's not. I mean, so so I wanted to you know, in addition to sharing the the, the angst and the solidarity, what should we be thinking about in terms of like meso level institutions? If it's if, you know above the union but below the constitution, and, and do we think that we have the right? strategy based on this, you know, 1940s statute that sort of took some workers and called them formal and, and left the rest to one side. So um, I'm glad somebody <laughs> heard what I was saying. No, but I think I think that um, I want to say one thing about that, just uh, again, the current events part of this, which is that um, during the COVID disaster, right, it was a period in which the state was astoundingly willing to send everybody checks, you know, change the child uh, tax credit, that kind of thing. And I, I'm sure probably some of, you, some of you heard this, but um, according to the Census Bureau, all of these efforts meant that child poverty was reduced from 10% to 5% in one year, which a, a friend of mine who works on poverty says just shows how cheap it would be actually to bring everybody up from the desperate circumstances in which we're living. And I think the danger of getting into the old arguments and that kind of thing is not to is to not recognize that when we're talking about what can be done, we're talking about the very floor of what can employers do to workers, right? How low can they go? What do you have to put up with to earn money? And if there isn't a substantive floor, if it's all subject to contract, then I think we have a problem. And the 13th Amendment is one way to do that. But there's also a way to do that in which many of the reasons why people stay in jobs can be detached from employment and put into the state, which gives each person leverage to resist the sort of grimness of precarious employment. In addition, not in a place of, but in addition, to labor organizing, and also I think would help labor organizing because people wouldn't be so scared. Um, and so I think I think that we need a new conversation about, you know, where is our baseline? And if we're thinking about the Thirteenth Amendment, at where is that baseline? And also looking at other countries' ways of detaching these um, these provisions from employment. Jacob Hacker talks about how actually Americans spend just as much as other countries do, but we do it through tax credits in this incredibly regressive way, which leaves the poorest people without any kind of access. And Catherine and I have written about how this is a stupid way to do social welfare provision. And if it were done elsewhere or, or, or a different way, it would not only provide better welfare provision, but it would also provide workers with more power to resist really abject working conditions. So let Diana have the last word. Yes, yeah, she can do mm -hmm. yeah, sure. um, Thanks a lot, David. Um, no. um, so two things. First of all, I mean, I think one of the important things about constitutionalizing or, or returning to a vision of constitutional political economy is it takes us out of these statutory debates as just who's an employee and who's not, right? If there were such a thing as actual liberty of contract, we're recognizing that there's, you know, uh, it's something about economic relationships. Um, and so then we have to go, we, uh, it's a, uh, it invites uh, this kind of broader understanding of, uh, of where that's important. Um, in terms of other, Yes. I mean, I don't think it's either or. I think it's incredibly important. And, you know, in an ideal, this reminds me of the, abol uh, the abolition conversation, because there's what we as elites um, in this room could, how we would fix society if we could. And I agree that there are um, all kinds of fixes that I would love to implement. But in terms of making them an actual reality, I don't know any um, organized, mobilized working people. Um, and um, and organizations supporting them, and so I, I think there is actually a lot of thought among many unions about what so what like rebuilding social welfare. Um, it's it's complicated, um, as you know. One of the organizers who um, who worked on the Bernie campaign in Nevada said, um, "There's a lot of folks there who want their insurance through their union." 
Um, so there have always been tensions between kind of the, the somewhat privatized welfare state uh, that uh, that unions try to build and that they have incentives to build under current labor law. I do think one of the best things way easier to form a union and then unions wouldn't have such incentives to um, to say it's better here than elsewhere. Um, you know, it, so that creates really, um, I think, problematic incentives. Um, but I, I think it's I think it's both and not not either or. Bring this to a close. Uh, first, of all, I want to thank this fantastic last panel, which uh, not have filled us with optimism, but <laughs> at least filled us with passion and energy. No more speeches, but let me very quickly, first of all, invite you to a reception that's going to be across the way at the Bancroft Hotel. We'll join our colleagues from the Law Reviews uh, Symposium over there for a drink. Um, I want to thank uh, our sponsors, the American Constitution Society, uh, Berkeley Law, especially its events planning and its media people who have done yo, yo, yo person's work all day, labor, as well as the Hewlett Foundation for supporting us. I especially want to thank Joey and Willie for this book, for pushing this discussion. I want to thank all of you because uh, while quantitatively challenged today, I feel that <laughs> quality and engagement uh, that you all have shown, and the fact that we have video recorded this so that it will be a continuing resource, and I think the uh, American Constitution Society will uh, be hosting it so that it can be seen is a real testament to all the work you put in. So let me mention one more thing, which is our, on a more informal basis, our LPE Infuse Week continue. My wife and I would like to invite you to an informal uh, picnic on Sunday afternoon in our backyard in North Berkeley, either buttonhole me or Jay Varela for the address. Uh, and two to five, bring something vegetarian if you can. Uh, but please join me in just thanking yourselves and everyone here. Thank you.